uh, my name is Dr. Lori Wenzel, and I um, thank you for coming today on our talk on the Notre Dame Cathedral. How many of you have ever visited the Notre Dame Cathedral? Oh, perfect, perfect, I love that, all right. Um, so I was a scripture professor at Cardinal Stritch University for 20 years, and then I was an ordained minister for 15 years, um, I did some chaplain ministry, and then I retired. And when my husband and I retired, we started going to the cathedrals in Europe. And um, in order to impress my husband, I would tell him every detail of every cathedral we were visiting. And um, we were in the baptistry in Florence, which is a beautiful church. And on the ceiling are all these Old Testament stories. There is a story of Adam and Eve, and the story of Noah, and the story of Joseph, and the story of Abraham. And I was telling him all the details. And when I was done, a woman came up to me and said, could you tell me what you just said to him? And honestly, I think he said, thank God, right? And he um, went and got coffee, and an hour and a half later, I'm still talking to people about what they see on the ceiling. And we realized in the process that people really want to know what they're seeing in the cathedrals. So many people walk in and out of them and don't stop to think about, these are stories that you all know, if you would just look a little bit more uh, carefully and um, at the images, it, you would remember the stories. And so I put together this talk on the Notre Dame Cathedral, and honestly, two months later, the cathedral burned. And um, so I've been giving this talk at numerous libraries and women's clubs and churches, and I have a talk on the Sistine Chapel. And what's come of that is that um, people keep saying, can I have a book on this? Or where do you get this from? So we are writing a book that we hope to publish in November. Um, we're waiting to get a few more uh, cathedral pictures from Europe. We're going to spend a little bit more time in Europe in the fall and get a few more pictures. And so everything you learn today about the Notre Dame Cathedral, you can take anywhere and look at cathedrals differently, including St. John's Cathedral in downtown Milwaukee. So let's start with that. So we're going to talk about um, if these walls could talk. And people always say to me, what book did you get that from? Could you just tell me the book and I could <laughs> look it up? The, the answer is there's probably a thousand hours of research into this talk. These are all the books that sat on my countertop forever. And this book right here is called The Golden Legend. It was the second most read book in the Middle Ages. It's like an encyclopedia of the great saints. I wouldn't advise you to read it from cover to cover because you would be bored. But it's a nice thing to have in a library somewhere. If you ever want to look up, like, who is Veronica? Or who is, um, you know, I don't know, someone else. Like, St. Christopher. What's the history of him? It gives a history of all of the different saints and martyrs in the early Christian church in the first 500 years. Okay. The purpose of any cathedral. Now, keep in mind, Notre Dame is the second major Gothic cathedral built in France. The first one is Chartres Cathedral. So this is all really new as these engineers are putting together these cathedrals, and they have an intention in mind. The first thing they want to do is provide a picture book of the Bible. When the cathedrals were built, people could not read. It was an illiterate community. So every single biblical character in every cathedral, that's a Gothic cathedral, they are holding in their hands an instrument of their death. The same instrument in any cathedral. So that if you went to a cathedral in Paris, and then you went to Chartres, and then you went to uh, some place in Spain, all of the apostles, all of the Christian martyrs are all holding something or wearing something that identifies them to the Christian community. The second thing is, it's supposed to spark the divine within the human heart. The cathedrals are so brilliantly beautiful, especially mid-afternoon when the sun comes in. You're supposed to think about the holiness of God. The third in case you're not reminded of the holiness of God, they will remind you of hell and all of the horrors of hell. And lastly, the cathedrals were built to honor Mary. So first, we're just going to take a little deeper look at these. Cathedral books provided a picture book of the story. So you all know this one. Who is this over here? Adam and Eve. The only naked people you're going to see in any cathedral are Adam and Eve. If you see anyone else naked, just run, okay? So you're only going to see Adam and Eve. And this one on the other side is? 
Noah, right? So you know that already. So what I always say to people, it's like when you were a child and you learned nursery rhymes and they were all picture books and you knew all of those nursery rhymes no matter what book you read. That's what the cathedrals were like. They were built so that in every cathedral the images are always close enough to resemble so that you could identify who they are. And I have a few examples. Peter, in any cathedral around the world, is holding keys in his hand. Look at how big they are. They're bigger than he is. Adam and Eve are always naked. David is always holding Goliath's head. And I love this one right here because you see the stone in Goliath's head. Look it up there and it's in the middle. Jonah is always in the belly of a whale. And then I have, in the Notre Dame Cathedral, you will see these Bible stories. And what I say to people is, if you're going to go visit a cathedral, have stories that you know and love from the Bible, and then go in the cathedral and don't leave until you see them, either in stained glass or paintings. You will find all of these stories in the Notre Dame Cathedral and most other cathedrals around the world. So, the second purpose is to divine the... Uh, to inspire that divine spark within. When the cathedrals were built, now Notre Dame Cathedral, we're talking 1130, 1140 is when the construction starts. People were living in wood, mud, huts with no windows. So they're living in these houses, and this is built with stained glass windows. That was magnificent. This is what cathedrals used to look like. No windows, paintings on the walls, short, dark. They weren't able to build anything over two stories without the roof caving in. They weren't sure how to do that. The third purpose of a cathedral is to scare you. So they have a lot of pictures of Satan and hell and what you're going to be like if you don't follow the laws of the Bible and you're not following Jesus so they have all of these pictures on all of the cathedrals about what hell looks like. In most of the cathedrals, they have the archangel Michael, and he's carrying a scale, and he weighs your soul at the end. If you have more good deeds than bad deeds, you get to go to heaven. There's no biblical reference for that. That's simply the way the artist portrayed the archangel Michael. Again, that's the last judgment. Most of the time, you'll find the last judgment on the outside middle door of a cathedral. And the last thing is to honor Mary. The cathedrals were built to honor Mary. At the time that the cathedrals were built, people were really struggling in life. Starvation was the number one cause of death. One out of four children lived to be 16 years old. They didn't name their children until they were two years old because so many infants died in childbirth. And people began to wonder if some of the reason for their suffering was they had sinned and that God was punishing them. There was a deacon who lived about the time that the cathedrals were being built, and he preached from the pulpit that if you didn't think you were good enough to get into heaven, you should pray to Mary and she would sneak you in the back door because Jesus would never deny his mother anything, okay? So she is very honored in the cathedrals. Okay, what gave birth to Notre Dame and all of the great cathedrals? Certainly the engineering of the medieval engineers. Before the medieval engineers, they were trying always to build cathedrals that were higher than two stories. But every time they did um, try to build something magnificent, the roof would cave in. So they have all these stories about people sitting in churches and the, the roof, the ceiling, coming down upon the people if they tried to build it higher than two stories. So if you go back here, we're going to notice, and even back further, they're going to have these flying buttresses. And what the flying buttresses do is they take the weight from the roof and they move it down to the ground. And so they're able to build higher than two stories. The second reason they were able to build these great cathedrals was cheap labor. The cathedrals were built at a time when starvation is the number one cause of death. People could not afford to pay their taxes, and so they sold themselves to large 
uh, landowners, the landowners would provide meals for them and pay their taxes. They would sign on for a certain number of years. And the serfs, as we call them, they were not allowed to leave the land or marry. Either one was punishable by death. And then, of course, the last thing that gives us great cathedrals is two bishops who are at odds with each other, right? And they want to see which one is greater. Lucky us. Um, bishop Sugar is the first um, bishop who really is a master builder, and he tries uh, to build great cathedrals. He lives in Chartres, which is about 50 miles outside of Paris, and he's going to build the great cathedral of Chartres. Bishop Maurice de Sully is a contemporary. He's a little bit younger, and what happens is he sees all the attention that's going to Chartres, and he doesn't want to share his great diocese people with Chartres, and he's going to fight um, and build a cathedral that's greater than Chartres. And because these men were in competition with each other, we have two beautiful cathedrals very close to each other. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Bishop Sugar. First of all, he takes some of the technology and applies it to St. Denis Church in Paris, and he builds a tall steeple, and he sees that it's quite successful. He also puts some stained glass windows. That's the earliest version of stained glass windows, and he paints the walls, and it's lovely, and it gives him hope that he could build something greater. He goes on to build Chartres Cathedral. This cathedral is a size uh, football field and a half inside. It, uh, about 13,000 people can stand inside the cathedral. 9,000 can sit inside the cathedral. Um, it's 121 feet tall. Um, and you'll notice that the spires are different. When a bishop built a cathedral, he built the, something about it not to be perfect. The reason for that is they believed that only God in heaven was perfect, so they all built something imperfect in the cathedral. Um, for Bishop Sugar, he built the spires differently. Uh, this is some of the stained glass, the earliest stained glass that comes from Chartres Cathedral, and they are one of the only places in the world, there's only five cathedrals that have this labyrinth on the floor that you can pray on, and they start building with these beautiful stained glass. The other thing that Bishop Sugar did, because he lived in an area that was close to a monastery, and the, the monks were well-trained, and they really wanted to help people remember and get to know the apostles. And so what they do on the Chartres Cathedral is they place in the hands of the apostles the instruments of their death and identifying marks. And let me show you how that works. Oh, not yet. Uh, the consecration of Chartres happens on June 11th, 1144. People from Paris went to Chartres. They walked 50 miles and they went to Chartres to celebrate this magnificent cathedral. Um, after Chartres, we have an explosion of other cathedrals across to France. There are 100 cathedrals that are Notre Dame in France. Ten great cathedrals and a lot of smaller churches. Bishop Maurice de Sully, who is the Bishop of Paris, goes home and decides that he's going to build a cathedral that's bigger, more magnificent than the Chartres Cathedral. He decides to build it right across from the king's residence because then the king would go to church at Bishop de Sully's congregation. So he builds it on this land, and you can see it's on an island from that picture over there. That's a current picture of the Notre Dame Cathedral. Okay, Notre Dame is built in four phases. It always starts with the altar, and Catholic churches always have their altars in the east because the sun rises in the east and Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is the son of God. And so altars are always in the east part of the building. This happens first, and then they build all the way down to the bell tower area. The last additions are going to be the two rose-colored windows here that are across from each other. Those are the last to be placed. 
Uh, the west facade of Notre Dame, this is after the fire. You can see how badly the images are burnt. There's a lot of smoke and damage. You can also see how dark the middle stained glass window is that has soot on it, and they are trying to take that soot off the window. They're finding that the stained glass is not as damaged as they had originally thought, and they're able to remove that um, burned layer, but they're doing it with almost Q-tips. So just imagine taking that window, which by the way is the size of 42 feet, um, and removing all that soot and fire damage. Um, Adam and Eve, naked, are on the outside of Notre Dame Cathedral, reminding us of what sinfulness looks like. And there are three portals. Now, when you go visit a cathedral, most of us wait outside the cathedral in some sort of line and wander around. But I will tell you that half of the statues and the imagery in any cathedral is on the outside of the building. So the next time you visit a great cathedral, take some time and walk around the building and see who you can discover. Because in these great niches and, and uh, portal doors, there's all this wonderful biblical imagery. Now notice that on this, above this door one, it doesn't look the same as door two and three. Why? Because Bishop DeSully was kind of a proud man. That's the only part of his building that he thought was imperfect, was that little triangle above the door. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the left doorway. It's called the doorway of the Virgin. Why? Because Mary is in the middle. Now, the medieval people were very interested in the death of Mary. And you'll see that middle section right there is the death of Mary. According to the golden legend, Mary died at the age of 72. The disciples all came to get her. They brought her to a place where Jesus had told them to bring her. And when they brought her body to Jesus, Jesus took her body, her soul went back into her body, and she went up to heaven with Jesus. Okay, so that's the imagery that you're seeing right in the middle there. They're bringing the body of Mary to, the, uh, to Jesus. Then over Mary here is a box that looks like the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, Moses carried the Ark of the Covenant, the place where the Ten Commandments were kept. So they have this box over Mary's head because they want you to think that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant, the new bearer of the new laws. She is, has three prophets and three kings on the side of her or over her head. And then you'll notice the very top, Jesus is crowning her in heaven and giving her a scepter of power. He is crowning her, and he is giving her a scepter of power. And there's a little bit of a close-up of the three prophets, the three kings, and the burial, and then assumption of Mary. Now, in these jam statues, we call those jam statues, those are really at eye level. You can reach out and touch them, and they're all biblical figures. So here we have Constantine the Great. He passed the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. He allows Christianity to be practiced freely. Before that, you were killed for practicing it. Um, we have an angel. Then we have St. Denis. You see St. Denis all over Paris holding his head. Why? Because he was an early bishop in Paris. 300 AD, Roman soldiers told him he couldn't worship Jesus, and he decided that he was going to anyway. They beat him. He couldn't stop talking about Jesus. They cut off his head, and legend has it, he bent down, and he picked up his head, and his head kept talking about Jesus, and he walked to a flower garden, and he put down his head, and he laid down and died, and actually that's where St. Denis' church is built, okay? So whenever you see the headless St. Denis in Paris, that's who they're talking about. Okay, so we did the portal of the Virgin. Now we're going to do the portal of the last uh, judgment. Now, notice right here, you can see that there's a different style here. This whole area, this area right here, that was redone 100 years ago. The rain had uh, washed away the lower statue part of this particular doorway, and so they redid it. Now, the upper section, Jesus, notice he has Mary, his mother, and John, the disciple, and two angels, and then underneath him we have the archangel Michael and Satan. Okay, whenever Jesus is portrayed with his cross um, or on the cross, 
if there's two people beside him, it's usually Mary and the evangelist or the apostle, John, okay? So always Mary and John and two angels and Jesus. Okay, a little bit of a close-up of underneath here. These are all the lucky people that get to go to heaven, and those are the unlucky people that have to go to hell forever and ever. Okay, a little bit of a close-up. That's on the bottom part. Remember from the book of Revelation where it says the angels will sound their trumpet and people will rise up from their tombs. They're rising up, and then they get to be judged. And that's a close-up. Actually, that picture was taken a couple of months ago. They have cleaned these statues enough that you, we were able to take their picture. Okay, And that's the Archangel Michael, Satan, and they're weighing a soul. And this lucky soul, his good deeds outweighed his bad deeds, and he gets to go to heaven. And if you go to hell, on the side of the doorway, they show you what it looks like if you get taken down to hell. That doesn't look pleasing at all. Okay, now, around, so here's the doorway that we just talked about. Around the doorway are the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples all hold an instrument of their death in their hand, and they hold it in Paris and Notre Dame. They hold it in Burgos and Spain. They hold it in every cathedral around the world. All the disciples are portrayed in the same way. So I'm going to show you how you can recognize them. St. James is by far the easiest to recognize he always has scalloped shells on him, on his purse, on his hat, on his garment somewhere. Why? Because Jesus called him from the Sea of Galilee. People say that maybe there were scalloped shells on that Sea of Galilee. And so James has always got um, seashells on him somewhere. He also holds a sword. He is the only apostle that we have in the New Testament whose death is recorded in the New Testament. Uh, King Herod beheaded him, we think, in about 42 AD. So he has a sword, he has seashells, and if you see him in Spain, he's going to have a, a traveling hat on that has a scalloped shell on it. Thomas, we think, was speared to death, and he has a book in his hand because, you know, in the early church, there were more than four Gospels. There were about 30 Gospels that were written. The early church fathers decided that was just too many books to haul around, and so they picked four. Thomas is worth a close fifth, right? And so I think when the artist went to portray him, they have a book in his hand because they feel bad for him, like his Gospel didn't make it. That was a shame. Okay, St. Philip, Philip always has the elongated stem on his cross. He died crucified like Christ, but in order to differentiate him from Jesus when you're looking at him, he always has a cross that has an elongated stem. Matthew has a book. That's how you know him. He's an old man with a book. Yeah, you see an old man with a book? It's Matthew. Okay, if you see an old man who's bald with a book and a sword, it's Paul, okay, because Paul was beheaded. He wrote a bunch of letters in the New Testament, and he's always bald. Okay, gospel writer John, he holds a cup in his hand. Why? Because after Jesus died, during the persecutions, some emperor wanted him to drink a poison drink. Usually there is a snake that, and you can actually see where the two nails are. There was a snake that came out of that. Um, why? Because he drank this poisonous drink and he survived. So he's usually holding a cup in his hand. He usually has a snake in it. St. Peter always has the keys, sometimes an upside down cross because Peter was crucified upside down. James, uh, I'm sorry, this is Andrew. Andrew always has a diagonal-shaped cross. He was crucified on a diagonal-shaped cross. He's the easiest to identify because he always has the X-shaped cross. And there you see him. This is Bartholomew. Unfortunately, he's missing his hands. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Usually he's holding a flaying knife, and he's holding his skin somewhere in his hands. Um, it was a form of torture, in the ancient world to be flayed alive, people could live up to two days without their skin. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, the other doorway is called St. Anne's doorway because St. Anne is the mother of Mary, so she gets her own doorway. 
Now, what's interesting here is that we really have three different scenes. At the top, you'll see Maurice de Sully, the bishop. Do you see him up there? There he is. He's right up there on the top with an angel on one side of him. And then this is the king. That's King Louis VII. He's kneeling down. He has just returned from the Crusades. They said that during the Crusades, King Louis VII killed a half a million people. Men, women, children, dogs, cats, burned entire cities on his way from Paris down to Jerusalem. He ended up not being able to regain any part of Jerusalem for the Christian um, kingdom or for the Pope, and he came back a very broken man. So he's kneeling here. He's a great patron, and he wants the Notre Dame Cathedral to be built, but a lot of people died at the hands of his army. Okay. Okay, so there they are. Again, we're moving here. We have Maurice de Sully, we have Mary with Jesus, and we have King Louis VII. And then down here, when we look, we have really the story of the birth of Jesus. We have Joseph. There's a great story of Joseph. They say that when Mary was ready to be married, the rabbi sent out a message Anyone who was interested in Mary, bring a palm branch. They all did. But they said that when Joseph came and brought his palm branch, a dove came to rest on his palm branch, and his palm branch blossomed. And so Mary knew that he was the right person. So anytime you see Joseph in a cathedral, he's holding a palm branch in his hand, and usually it has a dove on top of it. Okay, then you have the angel Gabriel who's announcing to Mary that she's going to give birth. You have the Annunciation. Then you have the Visitation, Mary and Elizabeth um, embracing. And then you have the birth of Christ. And it's interesting because in this, they're really not in a stable yet. Look at Mary's in a bed laying down. Why? Because that very important story of Jesus being born in a stable is not popular yet. It doesn't become popular until St. Francis of Assisi makes it popular 100 years later. So the story that people are relying on is from the Gospel of Matthew, which seems to indicate that Jesus was born in a home and not a stable. We have the shepherds hearing a message here, King Herod and his wise men, and then, of course, it ends with the three kings. So right across that doorway are the stories of Jesus' birth. And then on below that, you have the story of Mary's parents. According to the Golden Legend, Mary's parents tried for 20 years to have a child, and they were unable to have a child. And actually, they bring a sacrifice to the temple, and they're expelled from the temple. And on their way out of the temple, an angel greets them, tells them they are going to have a child, and her name is going to be Mary. So they... They're told by the angel, they embrace, they go off, they have Mary. That's the story of Mary's parents. Okay, uh, the jam statues, the things that are around that doorway, we have King Solomon, Queen of Sheba, we have King David, and we have Peter again holding the keys of heaven. And this is uh, all their outside treasures that we're going to find on the Notre Dame Cathedral. Notice that on the outside of Notre Dame Cathedral, you have all these misshapen animals. Just take a look at how ugly they are. They're there for a reason. The cathedral reminds you that if you're on the outside of the cathedral and you're not on the inside of the cathedral, you're misshapen, that you have to come inside of the cathedral and be reshaped by the love of God. And so if you're outside the cathedral and you choose never to come in, the, this particular cathedral will say that you are as ugly as the animals who are on the outside and never come in. And then I simply have a picture of, a close-up, of my youngest daughter for her graduation. I took her to Paris. Not that she was thrilled, but I was thrilled, right? So it was all about me. Okay, the bell tower. The bells were added in the early 1600s. This is what they looked like when they were redone. 
In 2003, the bell tower had to be refurnished with new bells because the old bells weighed so much that they were making the bell tower sag in. So in 2003, they recast all of the bells except for the, I believe that's an F-sharp bell, except for the largest bell, and they were able to take thousands of pounds of weight off the bell tower because the bell tower was sagging. So what they did before they put them up was they put them in the church. And I took this picture so that you could see how big they are. These are the chairs in the cathedral and that those are the bells. The steeple on the outside has been replaced numerous times. Most of us saw it fall. Um, it's been replaced numerous times. It's really wind battered. So every 150 years or so, the steeple has to be replaced. Okay, now that we are now we are going to enter into the inside of the church. So we spent all that time on all those statues around the outside of the church. In any cathedral you visit, bring your binoculars so you can see who you're, who's up on the um, roof and the doorways. But half of the statues and imagery is on the outside of the building, especially in those doorways. Okay. When you walk inside of Notre Dame Cathedral, this is a picture we took, I think, in 2009. Um, the windows, brilliantly colored windows, don't visit a cathedral early in the morning. Cathedrals are meant to be visited at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when the sun is streaming in. Beautiful light. Okay, this particular um, image of Mary holding Jesus is new. It survived the fire, but it wasn't placed there um, about 100 years ago. It was designed and placed at the center altar. It did survive the fire. Joan of Arc, she's the only female saint inside of Notre Dame Cathedral. I love her for many reasons, but I love her because the fire didn't touch her, right? So you notice that she was burned at the stake uh, May 30th, 1431, and she said, I am not going to be burned alive again, right? So she survived the fire. Um, one of the things they do, um, the crown of thorns was brought into Paris in 1238, and every year during Lent, for the four Fridays of Lent, they bring out the crown of thorns, and they let people see them. This is not my picture. I had this taken um, when we were in Paris. I took it from one of their sites. This is the crown of thorns, which they let people see. This is a close-up image of it. Um, it was housed at Saint Chapelle, and in early 2000, the Pope asked that the crown of thorns be brought to Notre Dame so more people could see it. They did, they were able to save the crown of thorns from the fire. The organ was added in uh, 1403, 7,800 pipes, and most of the organs survived. This is a view of the organ, and there's a western window, a uh, stained glass window behind it, and we're going to take a look at that in just a few minutes. So now we're going to take a look really carefully at the three rose-colored windows, which are the probably the most magnificent part of Notre Dame Cathedral. The west window is a judgment window, the north window is the Old Testament window, and the south window is the New Testament window. Most of the windows are 42 feet in diameter, which is really quite large. The west window is called the last judgment window. And what's interesting about this is you really can't see it very well because the organ is right in front of it, so you can't see it very well. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. What they have on the outside of the window is they have vices and virtues. So we have charity on the outside and greed, someone's hoarding in the middle. We have perseverance, the banner for perseverance, and then cowardice. And cowardice is in the cathedrals is someone running away from a bunny. Okay, that's how it's portrayed in every cathedral. Somebody's running from a bunny, okay? Faith and then idolatry, someone's bowing down to an image. We have patience and anger, people are fighting. I, this is my favorite, though. We have obedience and rebellion, and this person is snapping their fingers at the bishop, right? That's how that is portrayed. Dis and then we have peace and discord. We have uh, two people fighting again. So the, those are all on the outside. And so when you go to the cathedrals, you cannot see these small stained glass images when you're looking down from the floor. So my suggestion to people is always take a nice pair of binoculars so you can see what these windows are. 
This is the north window. The north window is never gets any sun, and it's the Old Testament window for theological reasons. The Christian church at the time wanted to say that Jesus' light never made it into Israel, and so just like his light never made it into Israel, the northern window never gets the light of Christ. Um, that being said, it has the most magnificent, deep colors in it. Let me tell you a little bit about it. In the inner circle of windows, um, there are 16 prophets. On the outer, there are the kings. They always recorded it. If you read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, and it talks about the genealogy of Jesus, the artist tried to put those genealogies in the stained glass window in what you have. You'll also see most of the time something what we call the tree of Jesse. Notice the tree is coming out of him, and David, King David, is one of the first shoots out of it. So you're going to see see that in most cathedrals. It's remembering Matthew chapter 1. Um, if you brought your binoculars, you would see some of the stained glass. This is Abraham, and he's sacrificing his son, Isaac. This is Moses. How do you know? Moses is always depicted with two horns. Why are they horns? They're really not. They're supposed to be shimmers of light that come out from his head because according to the book of Exodus when he saw the face of God his face was on fire and with light and so whenever the artist portray him he's got horns of light coming out from his head which is kind of hard to portray so anytime you see somebody with horns on his head and he also has the ten commandments it's Moses and David has a harp up on the top there, that's Pharaoh's dream from the book of Genesis chapter 37. Remember when Joseph interacts with the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh has the dream? That's the Pharaoh's dream. So that's how intricate some of the stained glass pieces are inside those bigger windows. This is the covered window today, okay? That's the covered windows. You'll notice a lot of the windows are blown out there from the fire, but that's a covered stained glass window. That's what it looks like today. The New Testament window. Okay, in the New Testament window, we have Mary, and um, she's surrounded by the 12 disciples, and there's major and minor prophets here. What's interesting about this lower area, well, we can go to the 12 disciples first. When you look at this, you'll notice they're all holding something in their hands which identifies them to us. And because we know it now, we can, here's Bartholomew with his flaying knife. We think this is Solomon's judgment and that at one time this apostle's window broke and it was replaced by some other image of someone who didn't understand that this was the 12 disciples. That's Philip up on the top. He has that cross with the elongated stem. And that's James the Greater. He has seashells on his garments. Now, along the bottom, we have the 12 minor and the four major prophets from the Old Testament. And then in most cathedrals that you visit, you will see that there will be four men and they're riding on top of the shoulders. And what the church is trying to tell us is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would not be able to write their gospels without the four major prophets from the Old Testament. So they're standing on the shoulders of the giants before them. In most cathedrals, you will see these four gospel writers on the shoulders of the four prophets, major prophets from the Old Testament. And I want to show you because once you go to a cathedral after this, you're going to look for it. The gospel writers are the easiest people to pick out in any cathedral because they're on the four pillars of the church in most churches and cathedrals. In, they're each assigned an animal. So St. Mark has a lion. That's why when you go to Venice, there's lions in St. Mark. St. Matthew has an angel. St. Luke has an ox. And St. John has an eagle. Here they are again in Spain. I want to show you that all the images are the same. You have Matthew with an angel, Mark with a lion, Luke with an ox, John with an eagle. <clears throat> again, you have the same thing, an angel, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. So every cathedral you go to, the four gospel writers, when you see them, they will have an animal at their feet, always the same animal. 
Okay, treasures that did not survive. Many of the stained glass windows were blown out by the extreme heat of the fire. So I've just, Jesse's tree did not survive. Some of the presentation and visitation things did not survive. This particular stained glass window of the Annunciation did not survive. Adam and Eve did not survive. The worshiping of the golden calf. And this did not survive. This was around the altar. So when you went into Notre Dame and you walked up to the altar, around it was this wood carving. It, the wood carving um, was placed within 50 years of the cathedral being completed. It's a masterpiece, and people were able to tell. It had the entire story of Jesus from his birth to his death. And these are pictures that we took over the years, and so the lighting is a little bit different on some of them because we took the pictures at different times. This, of course, is Mary and Elizabeth. This is the three kings presenting their gifts to Jesus. This is the slaughter of the innocent. Remember when King Herod killed the infants? This is an interesting one. This is Jesus being presented as an infant to Simeon. And this is Jesus in the temple teaching at 12. Notice he's the same size. And I always think, like, somebody told their son, I need these images, could you make them? And then somebody wasn't listening, and they turned out to be the same size, and the artist who was doing it was thinking, well, nobody will really notice, right? So that's Jesus at 2, and that's Jesus at 12, but he looks the same. Okay, that's Peter when he gets out of the boat. Remember, he gets out of the boat and walks on water to Jesus. This is the wedding feast at Cana. Notice the, the jars, and Mary's instructing her son, you will provide some good wine for this party. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, washing the feet of the disciples, Jesus at the Last Supper, John, the Gospel writer, asleep under the arm of Christ, asleep in the garden, and that's Mary Magdalene. And you know Mary Magdalene because Mary Magdalene always holds a perfume jar in her hand because she perfumed the feet of Christ. So anytime you see Mary Magdalene, she has a perfume jar in her hands. Thomas touching the sides of Jesus, and I love the side pictures of the disciples looking. You know, it looks like my kids when they were in trouble and they were watching as the other person was being scolded, they kind of peered out. That reminds me of the disciples as they're being scolded, you know, Thomas is being scolded by Jesus. And this is Jesus uh, before the ascension at the end of Matthew's gospel. And this again is just another stained glass that didn't make its way into the uh, through the fire. Just a little bit about the history of Notre Dame. How did the French Revolution change Notre Dame? Well, for 10 years, when the French Revolution occurred, they ransacked Notre Dame. They took down the paintings. They took down the, um, some of the wood carvings. They, took, they demolished some of the statues that had crowns, uh, when statues had crowns on their head. They used Notre Dame as a barn for their animals, and they set fires inside of Notre Dame to keep themselves warm. They cut off the heads of any statues that had crowns on them because they thought they were kings and queens of France instead of kings and queens in the Old Testament. And it's interesting because in, 19, in 1793, the heads were cut off, and they were unearthed in 1977. They were digging. They were doing some excavation work, and they came up with 27 heads. They're now in another a museum. Um, Notre Dame was restored for Napoleon's coronation in 1804. It was restored to much of its splendor. And then, of course, when Victor Hugo wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame, people were, again, really interested in Notre Dame. They hired this particular man. He made the inside of the church beautiful. He actually puts the altarpiece on where Mary is holding Jesus. And he also adds these statues to the spire. Undergoing renovation, um, Notre Dame caught on fire on the evening of April 15th. It burned for 15 hours. Some of these pictures, this picture is actually from the site that we 
When we walked around Notre Dame in March, this was on the outside of their building. They had some pictures, so I included them. This is what the scaffolding looked like, and the problem with the scaffolding, they were trying to renovate Notre Dame, but when the fire broke out, it burned the, um, the steel so badly that the metal bonded itself to the cathedral walls. And when they took it off, they were taking stone with them. So it was a, um, a, a very difficult process of renewal. That's them inside of the cathedral. That's what the cathedral looks like today if you go to visit it. It has these large screens on the outside of the windows. The very first thing they did was stabilize the walls and create a roof so that the building wouldn't fall in a windstorm. That's what they were mostly afraid of. You'll notice that all of these windows in the altar area, all of the stained glass windows has been burnt out of those windows. Now, what actually saved the rose-colored, the rose windows, that, those windows on the top, and every rose window has one of those windows on the top, that released all of the pressure so the flames ran up the windows of the rose-colored windows and out those main windows on the top. And that actually saved the three rose-colored windows. Renovation, um, they want to open at least the outside of the cathedral by 2024. And again, if you're able to see the outside of the cathedral, it has as much information as the inside of the cathedral. They have already taken down over 1,200 year old oaks. Um, in the ceiling before, there were 64 acres of oak. And that's how much they will use to renovate Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, they are training masons and carpenters to use the technology that they had almost a thousand years ago. Um, they have people who, I think, um, have heavily funded Notre Dame's renovation, and they want it done exactly like it was done a thousand years ago. Um, they have 200 people working on the project daily, and they think it will take them 20 years to get it back to where it was. And they're not sure what they're going to put inside. Are they going to redo the stained glass? Are they going to have new wood carvings? Are they going to go modern? I don't think they've gotten that far. They're really working on the outside of the building at this time. And that's just me, uh, picture. That's, you can't get very close to Notre Dame if you were to go visit it today. You'll see that, that cream-colored border. That's a 10-foot high border. You can't see beyond it. The whole block is encircled. That's as close as you can get on the front side. They have a little cartoon of uh, how the workers are working. And that's just people. That's, I wanted to give you a sense of how close you could get to the cathedral. Not very close. This is a picture we took on the side of the building. There's some restaurants. You can see how high the gate is. And then also see that there is wood, that they are using wood to reinforce all of the buttresses that lead, that carry that weight of the roof out uh, to the ground. They said that the limestone from the fire, uh, so much of the water out of the limestone evaporated. The limestone is almost chalky. So... It is a dilemma. This is the crane that's working on it. The 12 disciples, which were on the top of the building, were taken down before the fire began because they were going to renovate it and they were in the way. So those 12 disciples that were on the top of the building, they have been taken down and they are safe. And I wanted to close the talk with just a little about the clock. In every cathedral we visited, and my husband and I spent uh, almost three months visiting cathedrals in Europe in January, February, and March. We've probably seen well over 100 cathedrals from Italy, France, Germany, Spain, England. Um, they always have a clock on the outside, and I couldn't find out why. So I thought, well, I'll just make up an answer because you won't know, right, if I made it up or not. So, this is my thing about the clock. I think that you are supposed to come inside of the cathedral and see how beautiful it is. And it is supposed to make you think about God and all of God's glory and how beautiful life is. And the clock reminds us that with our beautiful life, we have a limited amount of time 
to do beautiful things in the name of God. And so the cathedrals, once you're inside, inspire you to remember who you are and who God created and that you have a beautiful gift with the time that you have left. And there's a sense of urgency to share the light that you hold within with others and to make the world a place of light instead of darkness. Thank you for your time. And before we take um, any questions, I just want to, I'm writing a book. My husband and I are writing a book. One of my former students um, drew a picture of Mary Magdalene. Notice she has a vase in her hand. Uh, we hope to publish it in uh, late November, so I will keep you posted. Um, I'm also giving a talk on the Sistine Chapel at several different libraries. They're doing a, a presentation of the Sistine Chapel in Green Bay, and I, I have a book that's much better, right? I have a presentation that's much better. So come to mine first before you go up there. And um, my husband and I did a private tour of the Sistine Chapel. I gave it to him for Christmas. I said to him, when you're, oh, I got you the best present. He said, what? I said, a private tour of the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah, it sounds like it's a gift for you. Okay, so, um, but we were allowed to take pictures. So I have all the pictures, what they mean, and who's in them. And then um, we're going to lead a group, Italy by rail or Italy by bus, and we're going to stop in all of the major cathedrals along the way in Florence, Venice, Rome, and Milan, and do some sort of cathedral tour so that people can... So that's it. Thank you again for your time. And um, I think we were going to take a few questions. Sure. If anyone has a question, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll come find you with a microphone. No questions. No, no. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I can't. The technology is this on? Mm -hmm. The technology of stained glass is complicated and different now and so what is going to happen to all of those windows that were destroyed and how are they being replaced and how are they going to look relative to how they used to look? Or well, we know? I mean that's a great question. The, um, the color that they're struggling with the most is blue. They haven't, it's like grandma's recipe, right? When she told, you know, I, my grandmother made coffee kuchen and then she gave me the recipe. It was a handful of this and a little bit of that, and you stir it this many times, and mine never turned out like hers. Um, so the recipe for some of those colors is gone, and they're not sure how to replace it. So they're not quite sure of what they're going to do. They just don't know. So... Who at this point is in charge of deciding what's going to go inside? How, how's <laughs> not, that process? And how not long will not it me, because I would do it differently, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think they they have a committee, and um, they have a lot of people who are really big donors, and I think they're letting them decide how to do things. It's you know, we're all giving a few dollars here and there, but you have people that are giving you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars, and they are the ones that are having a lot of input. So they have a committee, um, but they just aren't sure what they're going to do. I know they're going to renovate the outside, which is going to be relatively easy to what they had. It's going to be deciding what goes inside that's going to be a problem. Because Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is one of the biggest tourist draws. I think they have 5 million people visit the cathedral a year. So that's a big tourist draw. So how do you appease the tourist and yet um, remember what the cathedral looked like? There's a, <clears throat> what was a uh, church uh, that was taken apart uh, during the revolution uh, now has the, the whole end of the church was made into a stained glass window by Chagall. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of blue there. I would wonder, well, they must, they must know how he made the blue. Well, I mean, his blue is very different. You're, 
uh, is that in Amiens or Reims? I can't remember which one I've, I saw that in. We, we visited it this past year. Um, his blue is very different. The blue I'm, his blue is like the color of, I'm thinking it's your daughter sitting next to you. <laughs> um, that's that's what Mark Chagall's color is. What um, the blue of the stained glass is that dark, that dark blue, that really dark royal blue. That's so Mark Chagall didn't didn't do the stained glass in the same colors that were already in the cathedral. So I mean, his work is beautiful, but it and his work is very fluid. You know, it's, it's a big stained glass, and it has a lot of images in it, whereas the stained glass in Notre Dame is small. I mean, these, these pieces are maybe uh, an 8 by 10 of individual glass, so each scene is different. So it's very different. So um, I'm, I'm just not sure how they're going to do it. I know that's not helpful. Does anybody else have any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming yes, and sharing with us you. today. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.